Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome Mr. Robert Floyd, Chair of the Texas Capitol Vietnam Veterans Monument, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please welcome Mr. David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, Mrs. Linda Johnson Robb, daughter of Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson, the Honorable Hubert Vo, member of the Texas House of Representatives and Vietnam immigrant, Miss Lucy Baines Johnson, daughter of Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson, and Dr. Bernard Lefke, retired Major General of the United States Army and a Silver Star, Bronze Star, and Purple Heart recipient. The archive of this library contains thousands of letters to our 36th president, many of which concern the Vietnam War. Here are two letters from soldiers stationed in Vietnam during the height of, the pres of President Johnson's tenure in office, which reflect the dramatically contrasting views of the war held by Americans, including our troops. Dear Mr. President, here is a picture of a little Vietnamese girl and myself. She has three older sisters, two older brothers, and a younger brother. They live in a village about eight miles southeast of Da Nang. Their mother was killed by the VC. Because of us, she is able to smile. It is our duty to keep that smile, which portrays so much on her face. But there are many more who do not have the freedom smile which she has. It is our duty as Americans to bring happiness to those who may otherwise never be as free of care as she. To be able to pose with her and have her still look so happy gives the idea of the good we are doing here. This is worth fighting for. This is worth dying for. I know the weight you must carry on your shoulders, sir, and I pray that God will help you. I hope this letter and picture will bring you a blessing. She says the Marines are number one. Sincerely yours. <laughs> First Corporal Lee Vernon Bennett, U.S. Marine Corps. Dear Sir, I hope this letter finds the President in the best of health. Before I begin, allow me to introduce myself. I am PFC Nichols, United States Marines in Vietnam, and this is the topic of the letter. Like most of the servicemen fighting here, I don't fully understand this war. We're given training, long talks, and finally a weapon and told we have a war to fight so that the people of Vietnam can have a communist free government. In short, sir, we're fighting this war for the Vietnamese people, and I'd like to know why. Why should my buddies and other people's sons have to die fighting for what he doesn't understand or believe in? I've been here for seven months and probably will be here until my 13 is completed if all goes well, but never will be able to understand why are these Americans, and maybe myself, must die for people who really don't seem to give a damn? Most of us are hoping one day to see our loved ones, and to me this seems the most important to most of us. And if you were to ask the question, what are we fighting for, the honest men would tell you to get through these 13 months to get back home. I hope you can understand our feelings and answer our questions in this letter. Thank you, sir, for your time. The time you've taken to read this letter, yours truly, PFC Charles E. Nichols, United States Marine Corps. My, I'm going to read two letters from my husband, who also was a Marine in Vietnam. And we got married in December in Washington, and he left in March. And uh, he came home on our daughter's six-month birthday. This is May 31st, 1968. 
My darling Linda, today I was a very lucky man. About 11 o'clock this morning, I was back at the bunker, the battalion CP, and walking toward the command bunker when I heard the familiar sound of incoming mortars. Even before the first round hit, I yelled, incoming, and dived for the nearest hole, just as the first round landed about 20 meters away. Within 10 seconds, other Marines had dived into the very same hole on top of me, which was only big enough to, for two people to begin with. Rounds continued to land all around us for the next minute or so. Then there was a pause of about 30 seconds, and one last round landed right on the opposite edge of the foxhole. Fortunately, all the shrapnel went forward in the same direction the round was headed, and none of it came back into the foxhole. As it was that one round which completely destroyed the two company office structures next to my office and killed a small dog which was not smart enough to get into a hole when the incoming started. My office structure was only slightly damaged and the only marine casualties from that last round were the two mild concussions suffered by two men who piled in on top of me. Had the round landed just six inches shorter, all of us would have been killed. Needless to say, we all felt very lucky, even though there were a few others in the general area who did not fare so well. Often, Chuck's company uh, provided security for, for the road sweeps and uh, the convoys to the outposts near the Cambodian border. And this is an August 5th, 1968 letter. I usually outpost the road all the way out and then pick up the troops on tanks and Amtraks on the way back. Otherwise, the round trip would take over a day each way. We were a little past the half point, uh, half the halfway point when one of the Amtraks was blown up by what we later discovered was a command detonated 35 pound box mine. Command detonated means it was set off by a person hiding some distance away with a fuse box instead of a regular pressure or pressure relief mechanism. It was immediately engulfed in flames as the mine ignited at least six of the Amtrak's 12 gas tanks. I had one entire platoon on the vehicle at the time, in addition to a three-man forward air control team and a four-man Amtrak crew. The net result was 30 casualties, many from shrapnel, but all from burns. Just yesterday, I had received a fairly large number of replacements and had assigned over half of them to this platoon to make up for previous losses. Now they're back down to almost nothing again. For tomorrow's convoy, I've already made arrangements to borrow a platoon from another company. Someone is watching over me personally because I was on the Amtrak right behind the one the enemy decided to blow up and would have been just as good a target. Fortunately, the enemy didn't launch a group attack, a ground attack to go with it. I was very proud of the company again. When the chips are down, they're tremendous. This is a letter written to President Johnson by a captain of the Republic of Vietnam Army written from a U.S. training base in Alabama on America's 190th birthday, July 4th, 1966. 4th of July, 1966. The Honorable Lyndon B. Johnson, President of the United States, the White House. Dear Mr. President, I'm Captain Nguyen Tho Dang of Vietnam, now under training at the U.S. Army Chemical School and center at Fort McClellan, Alabama. I am indebted and grateful to you for your recently thoughtfulness speeches, which made me read over and over again U.S. history and its declaration of independence. Again, I found your speeches, the spirit of liberty which made America strong and free. I am confident with the generous aids and encouragement of your heroic nation, we shall finally emerge victorious in the struggle for freedom and independence. Enclose is a study I have tried to write in English 
for the first time, I am taking the liberty to bring to your attention as a token of my appreciation. I sincerely hope that it may express to you our burning desire to fight for freedom, that almost it may serve as a self-explanation of a humble but grateful people who truthfully show his weakness to a true friend in order to be helped more effectively. With my very best wishes and respect to you, the leader of the free world, and to your honorable family. May I congratulate you, Mr. President, on the occasion of your Independence Day. Thank you. When Patrick Nugent and I met the summer of 1965, he was graduating from college and already a member of the Air National Guard. We married a year later with a dream reception in the White House. Our first child was nine months old in April of 1968 when Patrick volunteered for Vietnam. Patrick did not have to go to war. He went because he wanted to serve his country. Like many wives of servicemen, I frequently went home to my parents. Lying in my bed in the White House, I often heard the picketers say, Hey, hey, LBJ, how many boys did you kill today? I lived in the terror of knowing my husband and brothers-in-law, Chuck Robb and Jerry Nugent, might be one of those boys. For my father, it was all so very personal. Three of our troops in Vietnam were family. All felt like it. It was daddy's constant struggle to bring them home safely and our country to the peace table. In January of 1969, Patrick wrote his father-in-law and commander-in-chief a letter. My father shared it with me because he was so proud of Patrick and grateful to him. His children and I remain so forever. 12 January, my dear Mr. President, Chuck and I had a very peaceful and eventful Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in Da Nang. The highlight of our Yuletide season was a telephone call from you, Mrs. Johnson, Lucy, and Linda. Lynn made a strong effort to converse with his daddy, but the conversation was one-sided, all on his side. Someday, I look for him to be president, of AT&T, that is. Christmas Day, Chuck and I made three stops to distribute the articles he had gathered. Our first stop was a small village some 30 miles southwest of Da Nang, where he passed out food and toys to the villagers. We then went to the Catholic orphanage in Da Nang and handed out all sorts of toys to the children. Our final stop of the day was the Naval Hospital in Da Nang, where we visited with the patients in the orthopedic ward. We also handed out writing materials and fruitcake. Christmas 1968 will always be a memorable one for two reasons. Number one, it was my first Christmas away from my family, and I hope the last, and two, I was able to help other people appreciate the meaning of Christmas. The war activity has increased somewhat since the beginning of the new year. Everyone is half expecting some sort of offensive around Tet. The hot areas are still located northwest of Saigon along the Cambodian border. Ten days ago, my aircraft came under mortar fire at Khatoum as we were coming to a halt on the runway. 
As usual, I didn't realize that we were being fired upon. My primary concern was to offload the 56 GIs I had on board. Thank God, no one was hit and the aircraft never received a scratch. The number of days I have remaining in Vietnam is diminishing quite rapidly, or as the GIs refer to it, I'm getting short. As of this writing, I have 88 days remaining. I received my orders last week, which in effect state I am to report to Bergstrom Air Force Base for separation from active duty upon return stateside. This letter will be my last addressed to you as my commander in chief. I consider it both an honor and a privilege to have served under your command and direction. I didn't want to see you vacate the presidency since you are the best we have but at the same time, I respect your decision and I am extremely proud of you. Our men in Vietnam know that you have done everything in your power to bring about a peaceful solution to the war. Unfortunately, we cannot negotiate with ourselves, nor it is our desire to abandon the hope of a free and democratic South Vietnam. You and Mrs. Johnson are in my prayers and thoughts today and every day. Love, Pat. P.S. I enjoyed talking to everyone last night. Thank you. And tonight, it is indeed a tremendous honor for me to speak to you as we come together to honor our Vietnam veterans and particularly those brave men and women who sacrificed their lives fighting for freedom and democracy in Vietnam. Each year around this time on April 30th, Vietnamese American communities commemorate and honor the fallen, the fallen soldiers. We also remember and mourn the loss of millions of lives in Vietnam who die seeking freedom. Today, on behalf of the Vietnamese American community, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for the sacrifices made by America during the Vietnam War. 58,000 brave American soldiers and their families made the ultimate sacrifice which allowed Vietnamese American communities to survive and migrate to this great country. 50 years ago, South Vietnam stood as a fortress of freedom and democracy, safeguarding against the expansion of communism in Indochina. In making the stand against communism, 58,000 Americans together with 250,000 South Vietnamese lost their lives. North Vietnam rallying cause was to prevent foreign occupation and ensure independent integrity. And over 450,000 North Vietnamese soldiers died in the fight for that cause. Today, what can we say was achieved these great losses? Why the communist states around the world have already fallen? Vietnam still remains a communist state. North Vietnam's primary objective of preventing foreign occupation has now turned Vietnam into a Chinese vassal state. Vietnam today still has neither freedom nor democracy. What has transpired in the 41 years since the war ended does not change the gratitude we have for the brave men and women of the Vietnam War as we honor them today. I mention these facts because to properly honor those heroes, we must examine what their sacrifice means to us today, and how much the cause of, for which they die still remain to be achieved. One day, when Vietnam is no longer un under the communist control, and is once a land of freedom and democracy,
the Vietnam War will no longer be a reminder of division. Instead, it will be a reminder of a high price that freedom requires in all great countries. On that day, I believe that we will have finally truly honored these fallen soldiers and the souls of those brave men and women we be proud that their sacrifice secure the most important blessing for mankind, freedom. Why am I here today? I'm here today because a young man saved my life and changed my life. In four years of combat, there were many soldiers who did this for many of us. The name is Larry Morford. He was 24 when he was killed, 15 days before coming home. This man was in a battalion I commanded in 69-70. In that area, if you could remember, it was the height of the anti-Vietnam War. Larry was a fervent Christian, yet he was one of the very few who volunteered. In the battalion I had, over 90% were draftees. He was one of the very few volunteers. One day I asked Larry, why, if you're such a Christian, are you here? I know you don't believe in combat as the way to resolve conflict. And I know that you don't believe we should be in Vietnam. Why are you here? His answer was simple. Sir, I could not stay home when others were fighting this war. Sir, also, the job that you and I are doing is the job of a beast. And the least beastly of us should be doing it. That was Sergeant Morford's message. He lived his sermon. He's the man that has inspired me to create an award every year at West Point, the Sergeant Morford Award, that sends West Point cadets to China also to teach preventive medicine in Chinese high school. He, along with a corporal by the name of Leif Fung, who was killed at age 24, are two soldiers that are remembered in China. We're trying to make soldiers be role models of what a good citizen should be. As Cardinal Spellman mentioned, a religious leader in the United States, he said it this way, if I had not been a priest, I most certainly would have been a soldier because they're both called to do the same thing, protect the innocents and right the injustice. I listened to Mark, our host, and he has given me a very strict rule. And I must tell you that I left the army and went to medical school and became a missionary in Africa. And in Africa, the rule is very simple. You can only speak as long as you have one leg up. <laughs> when you can no longer keep that leg up, you must give up the podium or the audience can spear you. <laughs> so let me end it by saying that it's only fitting that my remembrance of Sergeant Larry Morford should be followed by Sergeant Henry Kissinger because many of you probably don't know that before Dr. Kissinger became famous, he was a sergeant in the U.S. Army. May your parachutes open. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Mr. Larry Temple, Chairman of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation.
As chairman of the LBJ Foundation, it is my privilege to welcome you to this keynote presentation of the Vietnam War Summit. Lyndon Johnson would have been very proud of this summit and would have wanted it to take place. He would particularly have been proud that the valor and commitment of the men and women who served this country in Vietnam is being recognized and honored here. While few people seek disagreement and dispute, Lyndon Johnson never shied away from controversy. When this library was dedicated, LBJ famously proclaimed, it's all here, the story of our time with the bark off. There is no record of a mistake or of an unpleasantness or a criticism that is not included in the files here. The exhibits and papers in this library certainly testify to the remarkable accomplishments of LBJ's legacy. His monumental successes in civil rights were chronicled in the summit programs held in this library just two years ago. But this library does not ignore LBJ's anguish, the tragedy of the Vietnam War. His greatest disappointment was the failure to achieve peace in the war in Vietnam that he inherited and pursued. President Johnson always wanted this stage to be the forum for the great issues of the day. That includes reflections and revisiting of events of an earlier period to learn lessons to apply to the current time. So that is why I can say with certainty that President Johnson would welcome the discussions of this summit, including criticisms of decisions and actions that were taken 50 years ago. To borrow President Johnson's own words, the aspirations of this summit is to revisit the entire story of Vietnam with the bark off. There should be no record of a mistake or an unpleasantness or a criticism that is not included in this forum. Now it is my pleasure to introduce LBJ Foundation Chairman Emeritus Tom Johnson, who will present the program tonight. Thank you, Larry. It is my honor and my privilege now to introduce my friend, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger and I have known each other since 1967, when he was a relatively young professor at Harvard University, and I was a very low-ranking member of President Johnson's White House staff. In July 1967, Dr. Kissinger was a top secret channel for President Johnson through French intermediaries with North Vietnamese Prime Minister Pham Van Dong and the aging Ho Chi Minh. Through Dr. Kissinger, President Johnson offered a bombing halt if a cessation of bombing would lead to productive discussions between the United States and Hanoi. President Johnson even proposed a direct meeting between Dr. Kissinger and Hanoi's representatives. And as a good faith measure, President Johnson unilaterally halted bombing in the vicinity of Han Hanoi. The North Vietnamese response was entirely negative. And I quote, we can neither receive Mr. Kissinger nor comment on the American views as transmitted through this channel. In a very highly classified meeting in the cabinet room on October 18, 1967, President Johnson, Secretary of State Dean Russ, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and NSC advisor Walt Rostow asked Dr. Kissinger to make one more attempt. The North Vietnamese response, and I quote, there is no reason for us to talk again. What we soon learned was that Hanoi was planning a massive all-out assault throughout Vietnam, a sledgehammer blow designed to shatter the North Vietnamese Army and for them hopefully to drive the United States out. On January 30, 1968, Hanoi launched its Tet Offensive, 
it was much more massive than the CIA or our military leadership had anticipated. President Johnson and virtually all of us around him were shocked. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong attacked 36 of Vietnam's 42 provincial capitals and five of its six largest cities. Thousands were killed, but United States forces prevailed and won in every single battle, including a massive battle at Way. Despite his best efforts and the efforts of the French intermediary, the Kissinger Parish Channel, which was codenamed Philadelphia, was killed as well. In my opinion, no two men so wanted an honorable peace in Vietnam as did Dr. Kissinger and President Johnson. LBJ died before a peace treaty was negotiated. However, Dr. Kissinger and President Nixon did advise the President, President Johnson, at the ranch just a few days before his death that what they thought would be an honorable peace agreement was about to be signed. Unfortunately, the peace agreement Dr. Kissinger negotiated was violated by Hanoi and completely disregarded within months of its signing. But the American people, especially the anti-war activists, and we know that there are many in this room tonight of that era, anti-war activists everywhere, especially on American campuses, and the American Congress, and the American press, had had all of the war that it could take. United States troops did not lose the war. They literally won every engagement. However, after eight long years, most Americans had lost the will to fight. The price had become unacceptably high. In Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh and General Chiap never seemed to lose their will to continue the war until they had reunited North and South. I know there are men and women in this auditorium tonight who have disagreed and continue to disagree with Henry Kissinger. Yet I will assure you that he and LBJ also wanted peace as much as they did, an honorable peace that would stop the war and permit the people of South Vietnam to remain free from communism, from repression, and from totalitarian rule. How do I know? I know because I was there. I know because I took the notes of their conversations. I read the transcripts of their telephone calls and their meetings, sometimes without Dr. Kissinger knowing that I was on the line. I served as a confidential link between Dr. Kissinger and former President Johnson until President Johnson died. They both wanted an honorable peace. For his efforts, Dr. Kissinger won the Nobel Prize. And after you see a brief presentation, a video of Dr. Kissinger after he negotiated that peace treaty, we will bring him forward to introduce him to you. Thank you. The United States is seeking a peace that heals. We have had many armistices in Indochina. We want a peace that will last. <clears throat> and therefore, it is our firm intention in our relationship to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam to move from hostility to normalization and from normalization <clears throat> to conciliation and cooperation. And we believe that under conditions of peace, we can contribute throughout Indochina to a realization of the humane aspirations of all the peoples of Indochina. 
and we will in that spirit perform our traditional role of helping people realize these aspirations in peace. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former Secretary of State, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger, welcome. It is a, uh, a privilege to have you on this stage. Uh, one of the things I think most people don't realize is that you are not only the national security advisor to, uh, to, uh, and secretary of state to, to President Nixon and secretary of state to President Ford, but also a part-time consultant to President Kennedy and to President Johnson, as, as Tom Johnson just, uh, just alluded to. So uh, more than any living person, I think you saw all the principal commanders in chief around Vietnam up close. Can you talk about each of those men and what characterized their position on the war? Well, first of all, let me say what an honor it is for me to be here and to participate in a conference which is needed to heal wounds of the debates about Vietnam. And so I want to congratulate the library for organizing this and uh, providing the opportunity. And I'd like to say also that it's sort of symbolic that Secretary Kerry is coming here tomorrow night. He was walking around with placards outside the White House when I served there. Uh, and uh, the point I want to make is we've become good friends yeah. in the interval. And he came to my 90th birthday party and made a toast in which he said, he pointed out what, he, what his actions had been then and that it was a pity that we didn't have an opportunity to to talk rather than confront each other in that period. Uh, in that spirit, he and I have worked together when he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I greatly respect his efforts now, and it's very meaningful to that this conference would end with a speech by this distinguished leader of America now. Now to answer your question, uh, in the Kennedy administration, oh, the Vietnam was at first a relatively peripheral issue. Uh, the dominant concern about Indochina in the Kennedy administration was the future of Laos. And because they, in turn, had received the advice from President Eisenhower in the transition that the future of Laos might determine the future of Vietnam. Then, as uh, the administration went on, there was a document that the Chinese produced by Lin Biao, who was then a successor to Mao, who said that the whole world was going to be characterized by a struggle of the countryside against the cities. Right. And the Kennedy administration tended to interpret what was going on in Indochina as part of that process. But in those days, we had only a few thousand advisors there but that number was increased to about 50,000 in the Kennedy administration. Uh, but it was not yet a central obsession of American for, uh, policy. Then uh, 
Lyndon Johnson inherited a situation in which the government of Vietnam had been overthrown. The North Vietnamese had infiltrated regular divisions and not just guerrilla forces. And so, as far as I could observe, uh, Lyndon Johnson thought he was carrying out the spirit of the policy that had been uh, started by President Kennedy when he ordered the increase of our forces. And then gradually, as the administration went on, a president who all his life had been known as concerned primarily with domestic policy was engulfed in a division of the country that in a way has lasted to this day in its perception of foreign policy. And I must say he was an anguished person because he wanted peace. And, but his n notions of peace were that you made a compromise. And that is the one thing that the North Vietnamese were never prepared to do. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, I became involved because, in, because the normal attempt to achieve negotiations had all been blocked. And I became involved in the following way. I was at that time a professor of Harvard with no standing in the hierarchy in Washington. And I went, I attended a scientific conference in Europe. And at that conference, there were two individuals who talked to me. Uh, because they knew I had been in Vietnam for a few uh, weeks earlier that year at the invitation of Ambassador Lodge. Well, one of these two people had been the host of Ho Chi Minh when Ho Chi Minh lived in Paris for a year to negotiate peace with the French. And he offered to go to Vietnam and call on his uh, acquaintance on behalf of peace for the United States. Uh, I called up Secretary McNamara to tell him about this. Uh, Secretary McNamara discussed the matter with President Johnson. And amazingly, President Johnson entrusted a professor at Harvard, which was not the constituency that most favored him, uh, uh, with being an intermediary to two Frenchmen that no one had ever heard, be, mm. heard of before. And so they were sent off with a message from President Johnson to Ho Chi Minh that outlined the circumstances under which he was prepared to, to make peace. Uh, and they were received by Ho Chi Minh. And they came back with a reply which after six years of negotiations in various administrations we learned was a typical North Vietnamese vague reply that basically rejected the proposal but made it sound as if maybe there was something. So they brought back that reply, and I won't go through all the details, uh, but I was sent back uh, with another uh, message. And it none, in none of this effort did I ever see a Vietnamese negotiator. I dealt with the two Frenchmen, they dealt with the Vietnamese. Right. This went on for about three months. And then uh, after a while we realized that they were, that they were stalling. 
But I mention this only to show the dedication of President Johnson to achieve a honorable negotiated peace from the very beginning. Pre President Nixon had the problem of how he inherited the war. There were already 500 plus thousand troops in Vietnam. And the question, he had the same issue as President Johnson. How do you end uh, this war? And uh, how do you withdraw these troops without leading it to a collapse of the whole structure in Indochina and as some of our allies in the rest of South Asia were telling us the collapse of the whole structure. You can ask me questions about individual decisions sure, sure. Uh, that were taken. And President Ford was president in the very last phase uh, of the war. But about him, I want to say at the very end, when the war, when it was obvious, and we were talking only about the evacuation of the last batch of civilians that were stuck at the airport in Saigon, and I called him and said that we, it, it is now has, the, the, we have to permit the, the evacuation of Saigon. And if you read that phone conversation between him and me, he realized that we had to leave, but he wanted to squeeze out another 12 hours to see whether we could rescue a few more people. Right. So all the presidents were haunted in, a, in their way. Each of them were dedicated to coming with it, to finding a peaceful solution. Each of them had the dilemma how you relate American honor to the ending of the war. And uh, that was the dilemma. There was nobody who wanted war. There was nobody who wanted to escalate the war. Uh, they all wanted peace. But the question was, under what conditions can you do that without turning over the, the millions who, in reliance on the word of previous presidents, right. had committed themselves? Uh, Dr. Chester, let me go back to John F. Kennedy. Uh, there is widespread speculation that had he not been assassinated, President Kennedy would have reversed course and withdrawn tr troops from Vietnam, despite any evidence to that end. Is there anything you saw from President Kennedy that would suggest that over time he would have withdrawn our support for the war in Vietnam? I, uh, <clears throat> I've never seen the slightest evidence of this. Uh, it is possible to say that he might, would have done this but all the moves of the Kennedy administration while Kennedy was alive were in the direction of increasing our commitment right. and not diminishing it, uh, all based on the belief that it was a simpler problem than it turned out to be. But I have never seen a piece of paper and that would indicate this, and all of the chief advisors of President Kennedy, who were taken all over by President Johnson when he became president, were unanimous right. in both presidencies in supporting the course that was adopted until things got very difficult. And then, of course, divisions appeared. Right. But I have never seen them. I, I know no evidence that President Kennedy would have done that. Yeah. Uh, Lyndon Johnson is, was a domestic policy sage. Uh, he knew how to get deals done. He knew instinctively what to do. 
there are many who think he was out of his depth in terms of foreign policy. What is your view of Johnson as a foreign policy president? Well, President Johnson was saddled with the war from the first day in office. So you can't really judge what the foreign policy tendencies of a president who was swallowed up in a way uh, by, by the war in Vietnam. Without any question, uh, Johnson was a master in knowing the nuances of domestic policy. And he did not know the foreign leaders as well as he did the domestic constituencies. And so it didn't come as naturally to him as it uh, did in domestic policy. But on the foreign policy issues, other than the war in Vietnam, he had a, a very good relationship right. with our allies and uh, our enemies. Were, he was very eager to come to some agreement with the Soviet Union, but everything was so overlaid by the war in Vietnam. Uh, I thought President Johnson was a formidable individual mm. of, in some ways, it was a personal tragedy that he spent so much of his life to achieve that office in order to be impelled to do the th things that had not been his major focus. But I thought he was a strong figure, and I, I felt great respect and affection yeah. for him. It has long been alleged that Richard Nixon's presidential campaign in 1968 tampered with the peace process by sending an emissary and Anna Chenault to the South Vietnamese to urge them to withhold from negotiations with the North Vietnamese because they might get a better deal from a President Nixon. What is your view of that, Dr. Kissinger? Well, I have no personal knowledge of whether that contact actually took place in the way it has been alleged. But assuming that the story is essentially correct, uh, I do not believe that it had, that whatever Nixon did had any of the consequences that, uh, that have been alleged. Uh, you, you have to remember this aspect of our relationship with the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese, our Vietnamese allies, were always in a nearly desperate position. They needed our help it's, 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 as an essential component. So when a peace process was going on, they had a tendency to agree to provisions we put forward on the theory that the North Vietnamese would always reject them. Right. So in, 68, we experienced what Nixon then experienced four years later, that when the point came actually to undertake the negotiations, and they would have to assume responsibility for the outcome, that then the South Vietnamese leaders felt it necessary to demonstrate to their own people that they hadn't just been forced by the United States to do this. And so they had started a debate about something that I'm sure President Johnson in his day, and I know President Nixon in our period, thought had already been settled. So one of the key issues was actually to sit down at the 
table. And that, of course, then produced the necessity for the South Vietnamese to sit down at the same table with the people who had been fighting to overthrow them. Uh, from the South Vietnamese communist side. And so when that issue arose as a consequence of the negotiation, President Chu dug in and they started a debate about the, the way the negotiation could even start. Right. We faced exactly the same thing in a different way Four years later, we made a tentative agreement with the, South, with the North Vietnamese. And we thought the South Vietnamese had agreed to each of the terms when we had discussed them. But then when, when they were actually put, for, uh, were put forward, we went through six weeks of controversy about nuances and details. So that was inherent. That would have happened whether Nixon wrote his note or not. Secondly, uh, so you can, so some delay between the announcement and the sitting down was, in my opinion, inevitable. Right. And not caused by the Nixon letter. But there's one other thing to remember. In the public debate, it is often alleged that peace could have been made if somehow they had all sat at the same table. There was absolutely no chance of this whatsoever because on November 3rd, two days after these announcements were made, the Vietnamese published their conditions, which they never changed for the rest of the Johnson administration and for the rest of the Nixon administration, which were the United States had to withdraw totally and form a coalition government dominated by communists before any negotiation could take place about anything else. So uh, the Johnson administration official position at that time was published position that the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese had to withdraw before any withdrawal of Americans could even take place. So those conditions were maintained for the rest of the Johnson administration. And they were the principal obstacle to the failure of the negotiations in the Nixon administration until the v Vietnamese were defeated in the sequel to the Tet Offensive right. that Tom Johnson uh, mentioned. Because the one thing that the Nixon administration would not concede is that we would, that we would overthrow an allied government that had supported the United States in reliance on promises made by other presidents. And as soon as the North Vietnamese agreed that the existing government could stay, which was at the very end of the Nixon administration, a settlement was achieved. And I mention this only because America should not torture itself on the view that it could have had a settlement earlier if their presidents had been more willing. Uh, they could not have had a settlement except for just selling out and withdrawing unconditionally, which nobody would have supported. There was a Bob Haldeman, uh, President Nixon's chief of staff, said in a 1978 television interview, Nixon had no intention of quickly pulling out of Vietnam. He aimed to exploit the rivalry between China and the Soviet Union to improve relations with both of them. Vietnam was an expedient where America's bona fides, our intentions, our motives were being acted out. Nixon believed that America had to negotiate from strength to prove its willingness to fight. Vietnam became that place. 
How, does, how do you respond to that? Does that characterize, in your view, Nixon's position on the war? That characterizes part of Nixon's position in the war. This can be interpreted by professional critics of it, of Nixon, to mean that he fought so that he could do some other things. Right. Uh, that was not what he thought. He thought that if America discredited itself by abandoning its commitments in Vietnam, he could not do the bigger things that were needed uh, in, in order to make the war in Vietnam fit into a global perspective. And uh, so in the sense that he said, this is not only about Vietnam, but this is about trying to create a world order in which Vietnam's can no longer occur. In that sense, it's correct. Right. You, you uh, say in your book, Ending the Vietnam War, that the domino theory was real. The domino effect would have played out. What would have been the consequences of not waging a fight in Vietnam, in your opinion? Look. The problem of any foreign policy decision is that you have to make it on the basis of assessment you cannot prove true when you make them. That they depend on a judgment and you can always come up with a counterfactual argument. A person who had a great influence on our thinking, and I believe also to some extent on President Johnson's thinking, certainly on ours, was Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore. Mm. One of the great men that I have met, he inherited a sandbar with a per capita income of $600 and turned it in 20 years into a significant country with a per capita income of 55,000 without any natural resources based on the dedication and quality of, the, the, uh, of, of his population. He was convinced, and so were many others, that if Vietnam collapsed at the time that Presidents Kennedy and Johnson made their decision, that then the whole South Asia would be, uh, would be engulfed, and that the same thing would then happen in Indonesia, Malaysia, and elsewhere. Uh, and he maintained that opinion until his, his uh, death. And he was not a cold warrior in the abstract. He was a judge of what it took to keep his little country secure. Uh, Do you agree with I that? I believe it. I agree with that. Yeah. And uh, yes. So I think that the presidents who made the major decisions uh, had a reason for making them. Yeah. It, uh, in his 2015 book, The Last of the President's Men, Bob Woodward writes of a January 1972 memo that you wrote to President Nixon updating him on the military situation in Laos. President Nixon wrote a handwritten note on that same memo, which read K, meaning Kissinger, we have had 10 years of total control in the air in Laos and Vietnam. The result equals zilch. There is something wrong with the strategy or the Air Force. And yet the night before, in a CBS interview with Dan Rather, President Nixon said of the bombing, the results have been very, very effective. I think their effectiveness will be demonstrated. Uh, publicly, President Nixon is saying the bombing is effective. Privately to you, he's saying that they have done zilch. How do you account no, for that No, no, he was saying that uh, it's very, uh, one of the curses uh, of modern archivism is that every scrap of paper gets collected 
and it's then treated as if it were a legal document. <laughs> Here are the, the presidents. They work 18 hours a day. They're under constant pressure. And they write a note to their advisor yeah. in frustration that it's still going on. And Nixon had a way of uh, exaggerating his comments. Uh, I can tell you here what, when uh, Woodward called me up with this. Yeah. And, and he, he said, what did you do when you received this? I said, I did nothing. Uh, and he couldn't believe it. Uh, why would I do nothing? Because I had worked with President Nixon for 10 years, or eight years. And when, he, when you got a message like this, I had a tendency, after a while, to wait to see whether there'd be a follow-up. <laughs> and, uh, and, and if you think about it, that is, would be the normal way. Uh, you, I mean, on the worst assessment of the air campaign, you cannot possibly say that it achieved nothing. It, you can say it may not have achieved everything that, uh, that he wanted, and you'd have to break it down in what the various components uh, uh, were. And I think probably Nixon might have slightly exaggerated what he said publicly, and he surely exaggerated his frustration in a handwritten note, right. uh, probably written late at night. And, and, and I think one ought to analyze these documents that are floating around from that point of view. I mean, what was the context in which the comment was made? Right. But you had to, Nixon is a very uh, enigmatic person. Uh, and you write often that he would say one thing and mean another. So you had to judge when uh, he was saying... No, sh sh no, sh no it, it, it didn't mean another. I had a very clear idea of what he wanted. And you have to understand, you cannot survive a security advisor. You have only one constituent, that's the President of the United States. Right. And you must be absolutely straight with him. And the most important thing a security advisor can do, and must do, is to tell the President the options he has. Sometimes he has to save the president from ill-considered first moves. And if you abuse that, your utility is, is, is at an end. So Nixon, it's now generally known, hated personal confrontation. Right. And so therefore, in face-to-face -face confrontations, it was like it was possible that he expressed himself ambiguously. But if you, in any written exchange, you could absolutely rely on what he uh, was saying. And if you look at his record, he knew he was a very strong president in sticking to his basic convictions. And he took enormously difficult decisions. Uh, and there was no ambiguity about them. But it was better to discuss them with him in writing than as a face-to-face -face confrontation. And one will find in going through the archives, which are now available, that most of the key decisions 
when I was security advisor, were based on memoranda and not on conversations. The conversations played a very important role in the creating the mood and establishing the, con the general context. But when a precise decision was needed, it was best to do it in writing, right. which I think is a good way anyway in relations between presidents and their key people. Right. Uh, Tom Johnson mentioned your commitment to the peace process and the fact that you, in 1973, along with your North Vietnamese counterpart, Lee Duc Tho, won the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, there are many who allege that you are a war criminal due to the systematic carpet bombing of Laos and Cambodia. Why was that bombing necessary to uh, our strategy in winning the war? Well, you know... Uh by now, I'm in my 90s, so I, I've heard this. Sure. Uh, I, I think the word war criminal should not be thrown around in the domestic debate. It's a shameful, it's a reflection on the people who use it. Uh, let us look, well, what was the situation? Sure. First, there was no carpet bombing, so that is absolutely not, uh, not true. What the situation was as follows. In the Johnson administration, the North Vietnamese moved four divisions into the border areas of Vietnam and Cambodia on Cambodian soil and established base areas from which they launched attacks into uh, uh, into Vietnam, uh, and these divisions were put there in opposition to the uh, to the local to the to the Cambodian government. In fact, the Cambodian government told Chester Bowles, who was there as a representative of LBJ, that if we bombed those areas and didn't kill any Cambodians that they uh, would close their eyes to it. The LBJ administration decided not to do this because they were already under pressure domestically and for other reasons that Tom Johnson may know uh, better than I do. But then uh, uh, the uh, when Nixon came in, uh, Nixon had already, just before he assumed office, sent a message to the North Vietnamese that he was eager to resume negotiations. In the third week of the Nixon presidency, they started an offensive in which every week uh, 500, up to 500 Americans were killed. And many of these attacks, more than half of these attacks, came from the areas uh, that were occupied by those four divisions inside Cambodian territory. And uh, after we had uh, suffered 1,500 casualties, nearly as many as we suffered in 10 years of war in Afghanistan, uh, Nixon ordered an attack on the base areas within five miles of the Vietnamese border that were essentially unpopulated. So when the phrase carpet bombing is used, uh, it is, I think, in in the size of the attacks, probably much less than what the Obama administration has done in similar base areas in Pakistan, uh, which I think is justified. And therefore, I believe that what was done in Cambodia was justified, 
and when we eventually wiped out the base areas, the casualties went down by 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those were the decisions. And I would bet that sooner or later, any president would have had to do it because this is one that if you fight a guerrilla war and permit base areas from which the, uh, the killing units of the guerrillas are, uh, are sustained, then you are in an absolutely hopeless position. Yeah. Those, uh, I was security advisor. I strongly favored it, but I was not the, because I was at such come in. But it doesn't matter. I'm certainly uh, was strongly supportive of it. It was correct, and it was in the American interest. And the civilian casualties from this bombing along the Five Mile Street uh, uh, is uh, was justified. We have to ask ourselves another thing. The argument against doing it was that Cambodia was a neutral country. But a country that has four divisions on, in its soil is not actually a neutral country. And, and the leader of Cambodia, Prince Sihanouk, told the Johnson administration that he would, uh, in a way, welcome this bombing. When we then actually did it, there were press inquiries, and he told, said at a press conference, I don't know what goes on in the part of my country in which no Cambodians live and which is occupied by the Vietnamese. If any... Cambodian is killed, or even a bullock is killed, I will protest. Mm. He will. He never protest. Toward the end of his life, Robert McNamara stood on the stage after publishing a book and expressed regret over the war and how it was waged. He said that the war was futile and that his conduct was wrong, comma, terribly wrong. Um, have you any regrets on any of the actions that you took in Vietnam? No, we took, well, you always make tactical mistakes. Uh, I believe that the American presidents and those of us who worked with them were acting on the basis of their best judgment at the time. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think we, there were mis mistakes were made, uh, and some that one, in the course of discussing the Vietnam War, one should discuss uh, how one can, can learn from these. Um, but I, uh, I'm proud of, of the service. Um, and I must say, uh, Bob McNamara was a really good friend of mine. And I have huge regard for him. But one should not tell. One, this seemed to me after one should stand by one's decisions. Right. What is the biggest lesson we should draw from the war in Vietnam, Dr. Kissinger? The biggest lesson is not just from the war in Vietnam. I would say the dilemma of American foreign policy in general is this. We have lived behind two great oceans. And a lucky part of the country has lived in the center part of the country. 
where the consciousness of foreign dangers uh, inherently could not develop in the same way it had to in Asia and Europe, where peoples are being pressed together. So therefore, Americans have a tendency to think that peace is the normal condition right. among people, among countries. And when there is war, or when there is instability, it is sort of an accident, it is sort of an unusual condition, which you can remedy by one set of actions, after which you can go back to a condition of great stability. But most re deep international problems are caused by circumstances that have a very long time to develop. So to answer your question, we clearly, uh, we, we've been involved in five wars since World War II, which we in effect lost. We entered each of these wars with a wide public consensus. There was an 80% support for every one of these initial actions. But then, after some period of time, then people say we have to end it, and you need an extrication strategy. Well, the best extrication strategy is just to get out, but you can also call that defeat. So if you enter a war, you should not do it for objectives that you can sustain. And if you cannot describe objectives that you can sustain, you shouldn't enter it. Uh, secondly, you have to distinguish you, I mean, as a country, between those things you will do only if you have allies, and those you must do because your national security requires it, regardless of whether you have allies or not. So you have to make that distinction. And we have to learn, and this is, I would apply this criticism to almost all administrations, not to, to, not to get into these conflicts unless you can describe an aim that you're willing to sustain. Mm -hmm. And unless you are willing in the extreme to sustain it alone or to know when you have to end it. Uh, those are lessons you have to learn also from Vietnam. And, uh, and uh, but we also have to learn to moderate our domestic debate. Because in the course of the Vietnam War, what started as a reasonable debate about whether we were engaged in a process that we could master was transformed into an attack on the moral quality of American leadership. Mm -hmm. And when one teaches a people that is basically patriotic, for 20 years that they are run by criminals and, uh, and fools, then you, you can get a political debate that becomes more and more violent. And we suffer from it in some of our current right. uh, political debates. That is one lesson we should draw uh, from, uh, from the Vietnam War, which also means we should moderate the arguments, but make them deeper. Based on that view, uh, how would you assess the war in Iraq? The war in Iraq? Well, uh, first of all, I, economically, I supported it. Uh, 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 I had mind a different kind of war. I thought we would withdraw after Saddam was overthrown. I thought more of uh, 
to push one type of war. Uh, we failed to make in Iraq and maybe in Syria that we made failed to make this aspect, this analysis, which goes back to my original point, namely. We look at these countries as if they were one unit. Right. And then we see a ruler that is oppressive. And we say, let's get rid of this ruler. And then the people of Iraq or the people of Syria have a democratic government and can restore stability. But what has happened in Iraq and in Syria was at the end of World War I, the European victors organized a group of tribes, religions, ethnic entities. One of them was Syria that had a majority of Sunnis and a minority of Shias which in Syria are called Alawites. And in Iraq, it was the opposite. It had a minority of Sunnis and a majority of Shias. So in each case, the American president said, let's get rid of the top guy and we will have stability. But getting rid of the top guy uh, produces a conflict among the various minority groups who are then fighting for preeminence. Right. And so we have to learn that, that when we get into nation building, and then we, in such a war, we have to engage in nation building. And so uh, I think we did not understand the complexities of nation building as a general proposition in several administrations. Right. Uh, that's how I would assess the war in Iraq. We got into something deeper than we assessed at the beginning. Dr. Kissinger has graciously consented to take a few questions from the audience, and I will uh, ask him another question as you uh, who wish to ask questions, queue up behind the microphones that are on either of the aisles. I ask, please, that you uh, ensure that your question is, in fact, that a question and not a statement, and that you be uh, as brief as possible in, in, a in asking that question. Dr. Tishin, let me, uh, it's impossible to ignore the election as it plays out. You said in a 2014 uh, interview with Scott Simon of National Public Radio that you think Hillary Clinton would make a good president, but you intended to support the Republican nominee. No, uh, I, I'm not going to get into the... Is it... Is it fair to say, Dr. Tischer, that, that uh, that 2014 was a long time ago? Um, are, are you still inclined to support whoever the Republican Party nominates? <laughs> I haven't made any pronouncements. Fair enough. <laughs> I, if I might add, you were kind enough to say I consented to answer questions. I insisted on answering questions. You, you insisted. Uh, I wanted to give the audience a chance. I must say, to Dr. Kissinger's everlasting credit, he called me several weeks ago and said, uh, I want to take questions from the audience. I'll take any question that they offer to me. Uh, I ask that you uh, ask your question again briefly and uh, in, in a civil manner, and we'll start with this gentleman on the left. Dr. Kissinger, when the accord was signed in Laos in 1962, uh, they, ca they counted on the, the Vietnamese to 
honor the honor the neutralization of laws which didn't happen and they they did not acknowledge that that accord was broken in your agreement you had a side a side expectation of the north vietnamese moving their troops out of cambodia and laos and that didn't happen as as you as expected by the negotiators how do we quite right. how well uh it's a standard proposition, you can say, at least until recently, that North Vietnamese must hold the Olympic record for breaking agreements. <laughs> uh, the 1962 agreement uh, on Laos, uh, if, if you, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, was convinced that Laos was the key to Vietnam. That if one believed that Vietnam was important to the security of the United States, then one had to keep Laos from falling under North Vietnamese domination. And he is reported, and I believe did, recommend to the incoming administration that they should make an issue of Laos and seem to imply that he would favor even using uh, some American troops to achieve this. Laos being a less complex country in which to achieve this objective. Uh, the uh, Kennedy administration was not willing to put in forces but it threatened that it might, and as a result, there was a neutralization agreement. Uh, and that was broken by the North Vietnamese almost immediately. And they turned Laos into a, uh, into a uh, supply base and all the supply routes, most of the supply routes went through Laos. Uh, in 1972, when uh, the Nixon administration made its agreements, we had a lot of practice in violated North Vietnamese agreements. Uh, the, but we were faced with the near certainty that the Congress would vote an end to the war, no matter what, uh, what action would be taken. And secondly, we believed that the provisions of the Vietnam Agreement, if we could enforce them, would also protect the other two countries. Uh, we thought that the South Vietnamese forces that existed could withstand all but an all-out attack. And we would have enforced, or we meant to enforce the agreement if there was an all-out attack. Uh, then Watergate destroyed that possibility, and then the Congress legislated a prohibition against any attempt to enforce the agreement. And so, so we will not know uh, what might have happened. But you are right. It, by the time that these agreements were made in 1972, the American domestic position had disintegrated to a point where those were the best terms that were available. And it goes back to the point I made earlier. We must, in, if we end the wars, also make sure that the domestic base for it can be sustained. That's in part the responsibility of the administration. But the opponents also have to understand that if they think, if they achieve their objectives by undermining all confidence in government, then of course no strategy can succeed. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> 
thank you. My name is Jean Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Dr. Kissinger, it is widespread that you have tacitly agreed to arrange for China to take over the Paracels Island in 1974. On whose behalf did you do so? And given the current South China Sea situation and all the concerns in Asia and Indo-Pacific Ocean, what advice would you give President Xi, President Obama, and our Secretary Kerry? Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understood the question. It's the question that we tacitly, that we agreed in 1974 that China could take over South I'm not quite, quite sure I understand. I'll restate the question if you would very briefly. Yes, it was understood that the U.S. under your supervisor as a secretary of uh, the sec security advisor had arranged so that China could take over the Paracel Islands in 1974 so that we don't lose that area to oh, Russia. Right. Okay. Now today, what would you suggest us do on behalf of the national security of the U.S. and given all the attacks that China is doing on the U.S. on all fronts, do you think that the agreement that you signed with Mao and Lu Mao in 1972, 71, 73 and all that time um, is worthy of our 58,000 deaths of the American soldiers. Thank you. Well, first of all, for the benefit of the two or three non-Texas graduates here who may not, <laughs> who may not know what the Paracel Islands are, uh, those, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Paracel Islands uh, is a group of islands in the South China Sea located between China and Vietnam. And uh, depending on from which point of land you measure the distance, uh, there are either closer to Vietnam than to China. It's anyway a disputed issue. Uh, the Chinese claimed these islands because hundreds of years ago, a Chinese emperor drew a line in the Pacific near the Philippines and he said everything on that side belongs to China. So, and Chiang Kai-shek already claimed these islands. The Vietnamese uh, also claim, claim these islands. And the American position with respect to the islands has been the, consistently that we do not take a position on the sovereignty of these islands. In 1974, in the midst of Watergate, a war in the Middle East, I can assure you, the Paracel Islands were not foremost <laughs> on our mind. If, but there is no agreement that was ever signed in which we gave China a right to occupy the Paracel Islands, nor have the Chinese ever claimed that. Uh, uh, and so uh, I think you're, you're not well informed. The, there was no specific negotiation. Mr. President, you read it as I thought, under the window of the U.S. Thank Navy. You. Thank you, ma'am. What was the last uh, one? Yes, sir. Your uh, question. Mr. Kitchener, I was a South Vietnamese soldier who spent... 10 years in communist prison, thanks to the Paris Agreement that you signed with Hanoi in 1973. 47 years ago, you forced, you assured my president Thiel that you would support, you would end up, you would send troops to help our nation, our country, 
to, def to defeat the North Vietnamese if they invaded Vietnam. But you did nothing. And the result is that Vietnam fought with the communist Hanoi. And I expect that you should answer the question, what we learned from the Vietnam War, that we would never betray any ally that depend on us and trust us very much. Thank you. I uh, have great sympathy for these questions from, Vietnam, from Vietnamese. Uh, they had a right to think that uh, we had promised them support through a number of administrations, including the one in which I served. When Vietnam was collapsing, uh, it was impossible to convince the Congress to pass any additional uh, funds. We're talking now about 1975. There were 35 other nations that had signed on to the agreement when it was made in 1973. We appealed to all of them, and none of them was willing uh, to act. It was one of the saddest moments of my life and all of us who were, and uh, the day that of the evacuation of Saigon was one of the saddest moments of my life and of all of us who had been, uh, had seen the dedication of Vietnamese, the dedication of those people who served there, a little of which you heard in the letters that the two uh, uh, Johnson children read. I have sympathy for your question, and I hope no other American leader of his time gets asked similar questions. But the fundamental failure was the division in our country. Without that, we could have managed it. Yes, sir. Do you know how to turn it on, or is it? Is it working now? Okay. There you go. I Sergeant, don't need it. He just identified himself. I think the Sergeant question is Sergeant Warchuk, 198th Infantry, I Corps, Vietnam, 68-69. After the Tet Offensive, after LBJ refusing to run again, after Walter Cronkite, there was peace with honor as a striving, yet it cost tens of thousands of casualties. Would it have been better to skip the honor and dodge so many of the casualties getting out earlier? But it's a question. Uh, would it be, given the fact that peace with honor was, took such a toll uh, in terms of human life, would it have been better just to withdraw altogether? Is that a fair? Yes, the, the is it still working? The invasion of Cambodia, the, the extended time of the U.S. soldiers, certainly six, later 69, 70, sustained a lot of casualties. Should we have and withdrawn? perhaps we should have just withdrawn. Um, and dispensed I, with honor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if you look at the American political debate, there was no one. If you look at the uh, position of the Democratic Party at that time, you will find that nobody in 1969 and 70 recommended unilateral withdrawal. Uh, that the position of the Johnson administration was that uh, Vietnamese troops had to withdraw first, and six months after that, uh, American withdrawals would start. So a unilateral withdrawal of American forces in the middle of a war, declaring we cannot stand 
the consequences of this war. I don't know anybody who recommended it at that time. Then by two years later, we were talking about uh, increments uh, of withdrawal and very relatively few casualties. In retrospect, was the war worth all these casualties? Well, of course, if you lose a war, you cannot say. But what it achieved in any event was that the uh, uh, that the uh, uh, that Southeast Asia was not overrun. And it probably made a contributing factor to the opening uh, to the opening to China, uh, but it, it was a bitter ending. I, I do not blame you or any administration. Perhaps the fault is not in the stars, but in all of ourselves. Thank you. What did you say? Uh, just a statement, Dr. Kissinger. Uh, this is the last question on uh, on the right here. Thank you. Yeah, um, hello, Dr. Kissinger. It's a pleasure to hear you speak this evening. I've always been a fan of yours, find you fascinating. I may not agree with you always, but you're an interesting individual and influenced our world in many ways. Um, the war on drugs was issued under Nixon, and the long term of it, we have more people in prison in China. 70% of our prisoners are not violent. Do you think the war on drugs was worth it? And do you think it should be continued into the 21st century? And you think we should continue it or look at it as a failure? Or was it a victory? What do you think of that, that war on drugs and how it's affected in the last 40 some odd years? The war on drugs, uh, the, the domestic policy matter. Well, it affects people. Opinion? Opinion? Yeah, it was under Nixon. I, I I don't think any statement I can make on the war of drugs Fair enough. will be Thank you. significant. But I want to make one other point here. My observations are directed at an American at the American audience. I have great sympathy for the Vietnamese who are in this audience, and of course, their perspective has to be uh, has to be different and i'm sorry but not because of any action the administration in which i uh, i was involved in but it i it is a historic tragedy that america found itself so divided and could not solve its domestic debates uh, so that it could come out of the war with a result that was more compatible with what on a bipartisan basis it had entered. And that's a lesson uh, we should learn. Dr. Kissinger, you have made your mark on history. What will history say about Henry Kissinger? I, uh, I, I have, uh, I have no obsession about this. I had the good fortune of being able to come to the United States when most of the, many of the people with whom I grew up were killed in uh, in Germany. So I've always been deeply grateful to this country, and I know what it represents to the peace in the world. I've been lucky in being able to execute my concerns as my profession. And so I'm, uh, I, I'm not involved in what I'm doing in order to get history written about me. Uh, there is an extensive record, and some people, uh, and it will be judged 
although I must say the way the mass of material that is produced now in the internet age, you, I'm not so sure whether you can say history will come to a fair judgment. Anyway, uh, that is not my concern. I try to do the best I could, and that's all I can say. That's all anyone can say. We are, uh, we are not only grateful to you, uh, Dr. Kister, for being our honored guest tonight, but for serving your country uh, as a, as a, uh, uh, in World War II. We have many uh, veterans out there, including yourself, and I would ask now that you stand and be recognized by this audience, please. Thank you for your service, Dr. Kissinger. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you all.